Hi, welcome to another edition of BB Book Buzz, where librarians from BB Library uh, talk to you about what we've been reading and give you suggestions from thing, for some things that you might like to try. I'm Jeff Klapes from the Reference Department at the Library, and I'm joined today by Karen Stern and Beth Radcliffe. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit today before we get into the books themselves. I just wanted to mention that we are promoting this spring um, our many book groups that we have at the library because um, if you're interested in joining a group, we have a number of different ones for different tastes uh, to choose from. So I'll just run through them very quickly and by all means stop at the library and um, ask us about them and we'd love to have you join us. Um, we have Books by the Lake, which is a group that Karen runs that um, reads a single book every month and discusses it. Um, Catherine McDonald, our, our new director, runs a group called Supper Sleuths which works a little differently. Instead of reading a single book, they tend to pick a genre of mysteries, like uh, cooking mysteries, for example, or medieval mysteries. The and next one is Irish. Oh, we just had Irish. Irish mysteries. Yeah. And so every month, um, everybody reads different uh, titles from that genre and discusses them and, and shares their feelings about them. We also have Books on Tap, which is run by uh, Alyssa Staples, another of our reference librarians. That's aimed at... Um, young people in their 20s and 30s, kind of millennial um, millennials. Anyone can come to the group, but the, the titles are really geared to that kind of audience. Um, so there's, I can't think of some good examples of titles, but. Um, it's not, not, a, not one that I can come up I with. Yeah, it yeah, it's not just do the dry, the dry. They're no. going to do the dry, They're I think, going actually. They're going to yeah. do the dry by Lauren Groff. Yeah. Um, I also by do, what, I'm Harper. sorry? Oh, Harper. Harper, Harper. Harper, that's right, yeah. Um, and I run a, uh, a group specifically focusing on classics, which is called Timeless Tales. So uh, every month we read uh, uh, classic literature that could be anything from ancient Greek drama to a re recent Nobel Prize winner, um, all kinds of things like that. So that's a little bit different. Um, we also have True Writ, which is our nonfiction book group, specifically focusing on current uh, popular nonfiction. Um, and finally, we have a slightly different one we call Cooks by the Lake, which is more of a, it's actually more of a potluck cookbook group, but the idea is every month we have a theme, and you might read a single cookbook or books by a single chef who's well known, or books that are all about a particular kind of cooking. Um, and every month a different librarian hosts that, and it's a way to meet with other cooks and share recipes and, and uh, eat. And eat, yes. So, <laughs> um, so we hope you'll uh, talk to us about those groups and see if there's something that might interest you. We'd love to have you mm -hmm. join us. And um, with that, I guess we'll move into talking about the stuff for this month. So Karen, you were going to start, right? I was going to start, yeah. My book this, this month is called The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen. And um, big picture, this is a book about the Vietnam War um, and its aftermath from the perspective of a Vietnamese, which is not a perspective that you find that much in literature mm -hmm. until now. And it was so unexpectedly good that it won the Pulitzer Prize in 2016. So there's a recommendation for you. Um, it's told by a narr narrator who is calls himself a man of two minds and also a man of two faces. Mm -hmm. And it is very much about that, the dual nature. He's, he's, this dual nature comes from the fact that he's Vietnamese and French. His father was a French priest and his mother was Vietnamese. Um, <clears throat> so he never feels quite at home in his country of birth. It's also this, he's a sympathizer in the political sense. Um, he's a communist sympathizer, so, um, but he's running as a double agent. So they, mm -hmm. he's being run as a double agent by the communists mm -hmm. um, and w lives amongst the South Vietnamese and they are all evacuated the fall of Saigon in 1974, it's four or five and he comes to live in the United States. So there's, so there's more duplicity there. You know, there's duplicity in, mm. inside his mind. There's duplicity in his life. He's two people. He's two, two different nations. He lives in the U.S. He's pining for his home. But he's also learning to, mm. to he's learning life in the U.S. as well, and there, he's learning things that he, he appreciates about it as well. So this is a, this is many things, this book. It's, it's a spy 
novel um, with action and murder and intrigue. Mm -hmm. It's um, it talks. It's very much about the refugee experience in a new land. It's even a satire of Hollywood because he gets hired as a. Um, as an advisor to um, a director who's making the the big Vietnam uh. movie, and so um, so he, <laughs> it is definitely satirical, um, and and that is part of the other attractive thing to me was the sense of humor. I wasn't I was was a little bit mm. nervous about reading this book. I wasn't sure how much I was gonna be able to get into it and how how it was gonna grab me. But it is very engaging, and part of the what's engaging about it is the humor. It's darkly. Mm funny and and he hits you with it at all turns and you kind of you're like and, and just makes you laugh at um, his point of view it's a little bit it reminds me a little bit of like catch-22 mm -hmm. oh, yeah. or something okay. yeah. like satirical where he's he takes that look at, at the ills of society and just and kind of some of the futility of it yeah. and and it's and sort particularly of, the war experience so much exactly, of it is absurdist, exactly you know? it's, it's absurdist a yeah. little bit a little bit and um, and so and it is also beautifully, I mean, part of the reason it won the Pulitzer is because it's beautifully, you want to say, almost masterfully written. Although my, my probably my one criticism, and this is, you know, one of my criticisms, is that there might have been too many words, because I like shorter <laughs> you books. You like short books. I like shorter <laughs> books. But given, you know, the storyline, the harrowing kind of storyline, yeah. and the, um, the, the, the humor, um, in the end, it's really about this man's attempt to become whole. You know, he's this two-faced, two-sided mm. person, mm. and his attempts to kind of make, become psychologically whole, and, and, and all of our attempts to do that on some level. Um, so, so it really does, I mean, in the end, I closed the book, and I thought, wow, that, that deserved the Pulitzer. It was, yeah. you know, it was yeah. an impressive attempt. Now, was the author Vietnamese or Vietnamese-American? He is Vietnamese. He was born in oh, Vietnam. Okay. He was actually um, br brought out at the same, same time as the narrator. Um, so he was four, I think, when, okay. when his family had to leave. So he's grown up here. So, oh, but he has grown up here. But he okay. grew up here in the diaspora. You know, yeah. he, he was... Yeah. Um, so he certainly knew all these stories and lots of people, and he see he he himself obviously sees things from both sides yeah. in the same way that his narrator does. Mm. There's, um, um, the, um, there's a book by Lely Haysmith, say slip, mm -hmm. called um, "When Heaven and Earth Changed Places," I believe, and that's about oh, it's a, a it's a nonfiction. It's a memoir, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it takes place. Right before the well, it actually covers what happens before the war, but during the war, a young woman and all the trials she goes through, and right. eventually so coming to the states and mm. coming to visit Vietnam again. So that has the same right. Might have a similar personal. kind of arc, although this is this is more from just the end of the war and the aftermath. But anyway, uh, the other thing I was thinking about is a lot of people are watching Ken Burns' Vietnam oh, the, right now. the TV series, and yeah. certainly something that we have available at the library. And there's and a big coffee table book that is right, a companion there's, there's to the books, series as well. Right, DVD, you can stream it. Uh, you, have to, you have to pay for it, but you can stream it as well. So that might be, this might be a really yeah. nice companion piece mm. to that because, again, getting that Vietnamese perspective gives something, something new. Interesting. So that's uh, the sympathizer. Thanks. All right. So actually, that's a good segue into the book that I was going to talk about, which I don't have an actual copy of because it's popular and it's out. <laughs> um, okay. um, but it's Dave Eggers' new book. Oh, um, yeah. So that's nonfiction. Um, and I've enjoyed a lot of his stuff in the past. Um, the new one is called The Monk of Mocha. Um, and he's really well known for some titles like um, Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, which was about his own life. Um, what is the what, which was about the lost boys of Sudan, who one of whom comes here, and Zaitun, which was about the aftermath of the whole Katrina, right. um, Hurricane Katrina experience. Um, and one of the things I've always liked about his books is they cover actually like big picture issues, but they're always kind of seen through the experiences of yeah. following one individual's one person, yep. um, perspective through it. And, right. um, and so this one's very similar. Um, he's actually here this week. Um, I saw something in the oh. paper. He did a book um, signing or a book talk for this um, in Boston this week. Um, so this one appealed to me in particular because it's about Yemen. 
And you might ask why, but that's because. Why is that, Jeff? Why is that, Jeff? Uh, I've always wanted to go to Yemen. You haven't been there yet? No, and because they keep having wars. And um, yeah. yeah, it's um, Yemen is one of those cultures that I've always been fascinated with. People say, like, oh my God, why, why on earth would you ever want to go there? But people don't realize how, you know, it's part of the Arabian Peninsula, but it has a really unique culture and style of architecture and the history and there's some amazing places to visit there um, but of course it's been pretty dangerous for quite a while in, in the last five years in particular with the Civil War so this this book is about a Yemeni American his name is Mokhtar al Kanshali, and he's a young guy who grows up um, as a Yemeni American in San Francisco um, he has family back in Yemen um, but he and his parents live here um, and he's kind of a well, he's a typical like college aged you know he goes in and out of school, um, his family isn't well to do, so he has trouble financing his education and figuring out what he wants to do with his life. He's got family responsibilities um, so he works in places like the gap folding sweaters. He's a doorman at a really posh um, skyscraper you know residential skyscraper right. in San Francisco, and at some point. Um, through researching his background and his, his family history, he hits upon something that most people don't know, which is that coffee was developed in Yemen. And um, the even though it's now grown all over the world, Brazil, China, even um, Ethiopia, which is right across the Red Sea from Yemen. So, um, but he learns about how it was in Yemen that the coffee bean was first um, understood as something that you could do that with. Um, right. And so what's happened since then, of course, is that the Yemeni coffee industry is a mess um, because it was always a poor country. They never did anything with the industry. While, that, while the industry grew all over the world, Yemen fell behind. And then the war has yeah. made it virtually impossible for that kind of thing. So he decides he's going to, like, single-handedly, without any background or knowledge, change that. He's going to revive the coffee industry. He's going to industry. revive the coffee industry in <laughs> wow. Yemen. And damned if he doesn't do it. <laughs> um, by the end of the book... Um, don't tell it. I don't want to... It's not really a spoiler. Because <laughs> um, if you read the blurb, it tells you... I mean, but um, the... The whole idea is that he wants to go back there, and he has family connections, and mm. he speaks the language, yeah. and he looks local, and so he wants to go back and to try and find the the particular varieties of coffee that will be the the best quality, and also the ones that would be the most marketable to yeah. the coffee drinkers of the world. Wow! Um, so he has to learn about the industry, and he actually becomes the first Arab. Um, to get certified in this kind of tasting. Like a coffee sommelier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's exactly yeah. like that. And it's very rigorous um, so that you can actually determine the quality of different kinds of coffee. And, and it's, it is a lot like wine. Right. Um, and yeah. it turns out that there are some varieties in Yemen that are like way, way up there. Um, but the people who grow them need to be taught about the value of what they're doing yeah, and right. how if they follow certain kinds of procedures and stringent growing um, methods and so forth, they right. can they can assure the, the quality of the coffee and it will elevate their profile in the world and make it more marketable. Um, so, but, but what makes the book fascinating, I found, was that it's, it's actually, it's almost like reading a James Patterson novel. It's because <laughs> he has to go there but there's a war going on, so a lot of it is him trying to reach the places where the coffee is, talking to the people, getting the samples, um, and then getting them out of the country. And but there's a war. Getting them into the country. And then getting them into the United States, States because of which course, must be impossible. Getting almost. that kind of stuff through <laughs> customs, and so he gets kidnapped, and oh you know, and because because he's a because he is a Yemeni American, he looks the part, but how you dress and what your accent yeah. is can be um, a subtle indication of which yeah. side of the war you might be on. And he has to work with other people who he's not sure he can trust. So there's these 
like amazing nighttime drives through the desert More and harrowing intrigue. It is. It's it's, <laughs> it's really like it it you wouldn't think that a story about this kind of subject matter would be yeah. like edge of your seat, is he going to get out of yeah. Yemen? Right. Um, so a lot of the book is actually about the specifics of what he goes through, and it's fascinating. It and if you're great. a coffee drinker, I, you know, I love coffee, <laughs> but if, if you are at all interested in coffee, just finding out this background of like this common product that we all drink that you don't know this whole story about, mm. I just loved it. So. Um, yeah, so that's, um, it is, it's a nail-biter <laughs> in yes. ways that you wouldn't expect. So that's um, the monk of Mocha. The Mocha, the, the name comes from the fact that Mocha is actually a port, one of the uh, port cities. It's on the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, right. Near, it's a little north of Aden as you go up into the Red Sea, and it was an ancient port of Yemen where a lot of things were sold to the rest of Africa and mm -hmm. up through um, uh, Egypt and so forth. And it's actually where the where our modern word mocha, yeah, which from. refers to a mix right. of coffee and chocolate, yeah. that's where it comes from. So that's the the name of the where the name comes from. So that's two tales of harrowing, har harrowing, nail biting, yeah. for, foreign men intrigue, of two, and men of two <laughs> countries. So, so what's yours about? <laughs> um, Is there a war? <laughs> There is not a war. It is historical. Is however. there coffee? It's the Essex Serpent. <laughs> I love that book. Uh, yeah, by we Sarah all love Perry. this book. Yeah, yeah. this is um, great. And so there are similarities in that it's not in this country, but it's historical. Were you going to say something? No, it's not. It's in England. Yeah, it's yes. in England. Yeah, so it's a little bit closer. Um, so. This revolves around a woman who is freed from constraints. She's a Victorian woman, but she's freed because her husband, a cruel old man, has died. So she's free to go move from London to Colchester, which is a small coastal village, and explore what she's interested in, which is um, natural history, and the Essex Serpent, which is a sea creature with wings, maybe large, and... and that was a real thing, right? Well, it was a real I mean, myth, yeah. It was a a, the myth. Myth. the right. mythology the, is actually based on yeah. something yeah. that really happened in England. And yes. that's, that was a time when Darwin had just, it was that's a big right. deal. That's yeah. right. So, yeah. so, so there's all these things going on. Yeah. She goes to this little tiny village, and all the villagers are really super, well, the vicar of the village feels like they are superstitious. Mm. They all are very scared of it, and you don't know exactly. Me reading it, I was like, "Is she going to go to the supernatural here, or what?" So you you don't really know what's going on, but she uses it to explore us humans that there's this creature out there, mm. and she brings up all these these issues like evil and innocence and guilt, but all in this wonderful, lush mm. story. And fear, Just, right? Yeah. And fear, fear, too, yeah. yeah. And the conflict between science and religion. And religion, and, yeah. yeah. That's very much embodied by Sarah Seaborn, who's the widow, mm. and the vicar. And the vicar. It's great. All but these But they have dialogues. a relationship, too. I mean, they're... I don't mean a relationship relation, but they're the, the two characters. I'm not going to say a word about that, kind Jeff. Of, <laughs> don't, no spoilers. No but, spoilers. But I mean, there they is, get to know is, each other, yes, and there is yes. this kind of conflict of how yes, they how they forth. deal with each other. Yeah, yeah. And there's, but I wanted to say more about the language because, like these two books, there's just wonderful use of language. Oh yeah. And the land. Mm -hmm. She uses it to describe the landscape and the wonderful people that she meets and mm. the. A lot of them are odd characters, um, and she's, you just feel like you're there. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted to bring up some read-alikes that they're, like um, A.S. Byatt's Possession. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, that's yeah, a good definitely one. Like and Sarah one. Waters' Sarah Waters. Um, Fingersmith. Fingersmith. So both of those, uh, they both have a lot of different uh, time periods they cover, but both of those particular books are Victoria Arab books. So they're the same time period, the same countries. Mm -hmm. um, they also deal with heavy issues. They have wonderful language, mm -hmm. and they all have strong women. But um, I wouldn't call this a heavy book. I, that's what no, I love I, about I, it. it. It deals with heavy issues, like that innocence and evil, but the way she deals with it mm -hmm. is, is 
you just go along with the story. Mm. It's, it's, I, I thought. It has you thinking. It does have you thinking, absolutely, but it, it, the story and the characters and the relationships are all. And she, I think it's not very Victorian in its heaviness, you know what I mean, it, at all. Yeah. It's, mm. It feels modern to me in the way she writes well, rather, rather than a, Victorian. Yes, I agree completely. But and she, she also is, n she's breaking out of Victorian England. Right, yeah. right. So that is so she's really writing, wonderful. Yeah, she's writing about a modern woman in, in Victorian those in those right. times, right. which is kind of cool, yeah. She gets away with a lot of um, stuff. A couple of the things that I really liked about it were the there's a whole constellation of secondary characters mm -hmm. yeah. that she really goes into, and there, there's children and the wife of the vicar and the the other people in the the, the people in um, London who she was right. close to, but now right. isn't spending as much time with. And there's all these characters that are really important to the story, and children too, and the children. Yeah, and, and she writes them all. They all have like depth. And, yeah, great. And yeah, and um, yet the story doesn't ever get bogged down. I mean, that's what I think is amazing about the like you were saying, yeah. the flow yeah. of it. Yeah, she she manages to do all these things and yet still keep it moving along, and and you engaged. Yeah. And I also liked this. Sounds like this is almost true of all of the books we've talked about so far. I, I love books with a real strong sense of place yeah, that really absolutely. describe the yeah. location in some way that makes it more important than that it that it's important that it had to take place there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's I found this interesting because Essex in England is like probably one of the, like it's the flattest, most featureless, uninteresting, but back she water. makes it. It's a backwater, yeah, which is, is a great But she a makes it come, you know, like, to make a place like that come alive and have so much depth and beauty, the the way she describes the yeah. coastal and the estuaries and stuff, um, she makes a place that would otherwise seem like a bland place that you would just ignore into yeah. a place In that's fact, full of... In fact, it's more London that's a dreary yeah. place. Yeah, that's yeah. right. She does that. Exactly. She does yeah. that contrast really well. You know really what well. it reminded me? That, I wouldn't call this a read-alike, but um, yeah, I guess, I guess it is. It's why, why I'm thinking of it. There's an older book, um, and I won't remember the name, <laughs> but we're a library, so you can call us and we can look it up. Um, <laughs> it's about Easter Island. Um, oh, right. And it's a similar kind of story in that it describes, um, the thing that's different about it is it takes place in two different times. It, it alternates between the present day um. and Victorian the exact more like same possession, time. right? Yes, yeah. it's more like yeah. that. Yeah. And so in the Victorian era, there is a woman and her husband who go to Easter Island for research purposes, like the whole Darwin right. thing. Right, natural history yeah. stuff. So yeah. it's actually that kind of woman who's breaking out of the traditions of her time yeah. period. She's fascinated yeah. by science. And yeah, then in the modern you know, times, like, there is a young woman who is a contemporary woman who's also going to Easter Island, and sh there's a connection between the two, like a historical family yeah. connection between yeah. the two, and so it. And, and I really liked it for a lot of the same reasons. It's not as literary as the Essex Serpent, but I liked that feeling of feeling the Victor Victorian era blossom out of yeah. the things that we Come think along. restrict Moving into the modern age. Moving into the yeah, modern yeah, age. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and with a strong woman character that does it. There yeah. were two other read-alikes that I thought of these for this book. They, they aren't historicals. Um, the Monsters of Templeton by Lauren Groff. Lauren Groff, right. Yeah. That's right. And um, Jim Lynch wrote The Highest Tide. So both of those aren't historical, but they have... Um, the um, super, not supernatural, the um, natural current, natural creatures that have maybe a little bit of monster in them. And again, they use them to play against what's going on with the humans. Right. So uh, The Highest Tide, I think, is a really great book. It doesn't get a lot of mm -hmm. notice, but that's a really great one. And that's the author is? Jim Lynch. Jim Lynch, mm -hmm. right. Did you want to talk I about? I have another um, one on the table. The blame, that, too, which I think we all did. You read that, Karen? No, I haven't read I, that. One. I read it too. This is the the Heart's Invisible Fury by John Boyne, and this is uh, what did we say it was? A clef a clef a roman? A buildings roman. A Build, buildings, buildings roman. roman yeah. yeah. Um, because um, it follows a boy, a young boy, through his life, mm -hmm. and 
in that he hits a lot of um, historical points. Yeah. I mean, it's a coming it's, of age story, but it goes way beyond age that. Story. Again, beautiful writing, um, beautiful storyline. And what happens is you start out with his, the, it's about a boy's coming of age. So his mother giving birth to him, and then it jumps to when he's seven years old. And then jumps to when he's 14. So it keeps on following these mm. seven years. And it's years, in Ireland. Seven it's all, it and takes it's all place in Ireland. Ireland. Sorry. Yeah. So another outside of our country. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it follows the course of history as well as it, is it sort yeah. of, right. So yeah. he's a gay boy and becomes a gay man. So a lot of it follows gay history. Right. Although Ireland is so repressive that it's also following Irish history yeah. mm -hmm. and what happens there. Would you and say? there was a lot of class history and yeah, the influence of the church in Ireland. And yeah, um, and it's quirky. Again, it's, the, it's, his parents there's adopt some funny him. Or really very, funny stuff in yeah. it. Yeah. I, I picked it up because um, both, actually both that and the Essex Serpent were on a lot of best of lists last mm -hmm. year. Not and necessarily award winners, so. but like, you know, books that you came Must out in read, 2017 yeah. Yeah. that you Must really read. have to read. And I, I picked it up because it sounded kind of interesting to me. And then I saw that it was like 600 pages. <laughs> and I went, oh. um, it but goes really quickly. I, I think I read it in two days. I couldn't yeah. put it down. It was oh, wow. absolutely That's a, that's a recommendation. <laughs> and the, the, the writing was beautiful. The, the, um, the whole bit about his, his mother giving him up, there's all these places in the story where over, well, decades. Decades, yeah. Um, where he and his mother just pass by just pass by each other in some way mm. and so you're always wondering at what point will they meet and actually realize mm. will they find out right. and, or not because um, there's all these close calls yeah. And, yeah. and stuff and, and you really you really are invested in, in the boy he's right. just yeah really takes and it's funny Oh, it is. It's hysterically funny. You get and, so warm, close to him. But there, the there was a lot of really beautiful writing in it, and he's written. I I read um, one other book by him that was kind of a Victorian haunted house story, mm. which I think also takes place in Essex or some some place like that in England, and it was it was good. It was very beautifully written. I didn't think it was as good as some other things like that. It was very traditional. Mm. Um, I didn't think there was anything that really made it stand out. So this is really a breakout. So this was a breakout book, except that he also wrote The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Right. Which that's is, right. That's right. so what I think is interesting yep. about that's him is every one of his books is like so different from every other. Mm. Um, which that one's really different from this. Have you read, I, I keep meaning I to and it, I haven't gotten it, around to it. It seems much more striking, you know, much yeah. more uh, harsh. The yeah. whole history. And it's a, it's a crossover. It's, it's kind of a young adult right. novel, right. although yeah. it, it's mm -hmm. been very popular with adults, too. It doesn't strike me that there's that much humor in it, but no. I haven't read it. so. And that was made into a film. Right, actually, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I, have, I find I have to be in the mood for Holocaust stories. Like, I have to be geared <laughs> up to read those, and um, I haven't been in the mood yet <laughs> to read that one. But um, I was really struck by like those three books of his being yeah, like so unbelievably different, different from each other. Um, but yeah, I would I would highly recommend this. Um, so the heart's invisible furies. Yes. Good. What are what else? What are you reading now? I am. Uh, I'm reading now. I'm reading. You Samantha. were trying to finish a whole bunch of I, stuff. I have, I'm in the middle. Of, well, I'm actually still in the middle of the Essex Serpent, but I am reading Samantha Irby's "We Are Never Meeting in Real Life," which is a complete departure from anything we've talked about here. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually it's um, essays. So there, it's it's. Mem I would say it's more like a memoir, but they're essays from different points in her life, um, and a lot of it is not things that I would want to say on air. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is a family show. This is a family yeah. show and it is and but it's it's fabulously funny. She's very in your face in a in a very funny, very modern way. Um, she's talking about modern problems of modern women. Um, she's talking about problems of modern black women. 
as she is one. She she also has a, a debilitating um, some some physical issues that are debilitating. So she talks from that point of view, but she's just very unapologetic and open and funny. And like I said, in your face. Um, and she takes you right through all of some of the most intimate details of mm. her life. So you have to, you know, this is not for everyone, but um, but it is a great. Um, I think it would be a great one for the Books on Tap book group oh, yeah. to read. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would great. I would definitely recommend it if with those thoughts in mind. Yeah. Highly recommend. So thank you for joining us. Um, we'll see you again next month, and we hope we'll see you sometime at BB Library to talk more about books. Mm -hmm.